Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you once again for allowing me to speak the gospel. We'll just open this meeting with a quick word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity now to proclaim the gospel, for it is the power of God until salvation to those who believe. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to preach a message like this in a land in Australia where there's no persecution or no threats. We can preach this message freely, that the gospel is available for all who believe. And Heavenly Father, please help me as I speak today to speak clearly and concisely and speak of Christ for what he's done for me and for all of us. We offer our praises and thanksgiving in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our passage today is from Mark chapter 5. Mark, Mark chapter 5. In verse 1, Mark 5, verse 1, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadareans. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately they met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him. And the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he answered him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And we'll go down to verse 15. Verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And down to verse 20. And he departed and began to publish in the capitalist how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. And we trust the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Today I want to consider the phrase in Mark chapter 5, what is thy name? And when you get asked a question, what is thy name? I could phrase it and say, who are you? Who are you really? What do you characterize as? And before we actually answer that question, we'll talk about the, the man that asked that question. And his name is Jesus Christ. I call him the Lord Jesus Christ, as he is the Lord of my life. And what does his name mean? His name means Savior. You see in the Bible, we read that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. A passage which is familiar to all of us during Christmas time, when the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds by night and said, for unto you, born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So who are you? I know most of you here in this audience, but who are you really? When you ask that question uh, in this world, who are you? People like to pride themselves in what they do. This week I commenced a full-time inter uh, internship working at an accounting firm in the city. And people love that question. Who are you? Oh, I'm Ben. I'm the senior analyst. I'm Richard, I'm the partner, I've obtained my CA, I've done all these professional accreditations, I've got one of the best scores in Melbourne University, that's who they are. People love to pride in that. They love to tell us what they do. Who are you? That's who they are. You know, whether it's status or knowledge or, 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 or other identities, people can have. People may have a geographical identity. You may be uh, related to a place where you live. I'm Sean, I live in Berwick. People may have a sporting identity. You may follow a certain sports team. Or you may have a political identity. You may vote for a particular party in parliament. But we read here of a man who has a lot of things wrong. We firstly read in verse 2 that he was unclean. He had an unclean spirit. He was possessed by demons. And his dwelling was in the caves, in the tombs. Imagine a man living in a graveside. That, this is the man that we were dealing with here. 
something completely against human instinct. You wouldn't see someone in their right mind going to a grave sign and dwelling, but he had an unclean spirit. He was possessed by demons. We also read in verses 3 and 4 that no man could actually tame him. He was bound with both fetters in his, on his feet or um, shackles and chains on his arms. But we read here that he actually broke those off. He had supernatural strength. He was untamable for all purposes. He was someone who was a frenzy, a freak, someone that none of us would ever want dealings with. Hence why he lived in the country across the sea. We also read that he was unsettled. Every night and day he was crying. He was cutting himself with stones, a self-destructive man. He had all these things. He was in his wrong mind, not only physically, not only mentally, but spiritually. Everything could be wrong with this man. <clears throat> you could even call him a lost cause. And us in the audience sitting here, we may think, wow, the picture that Mark here paints of this man is very, it's very grim. He doesn't have much going on for him. And we may also think in our mind that we are much better than him. We're not doing all these things. We're not possessed by a spirit or we're not having an unclean person dwelling inside us or we're not living uncontrollable and untamable life. We're much better than this man. This man actually needs help. He's someone that if we see someone like this in society, we would say that this person actually genuinely needs help. We don't need help. We're fine as we are. But friends, let me tell you who you really are. You're a sinner that needs to be saved. You see, the Bible says that we all have sinned. Every single one of us have this issue of sin. And it's because of our sin that we are actually separated from a holy and righteous God. The Bible talks that there is none righteous, no, not one. And all our good deeds are as filthy rags. We may sometimes do something good, but with the wrong purpose. We may sometimes say something accidentally, with the wrong meaning. We all have sinned. We've all done wrong. It's something which is universally accepted. And for someone here, hearing that, they may be quite put off. Oh, you can't call me a sinner. You don't know what I've done. You don't know my past. But the Bible says that we all have sinned. Every single one of us. And we have to accept that. That we are sinners before a holy and righteous God. But there's a solution to this. And we read that God, the very God that created this universe with, with, with His voice, the one who is so majestic and wonderful, He sent His Son into this world. We considered that this morning. He sent His Son voluntarily into this world. The Lord Jesus Christ chose to be born into this world. We know the verse, Behold, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. He came to do the Father's will. You see, God has an interest in mankind. He doesn't want for us to perish, but for us to have everlasting life through His Son. That's why He sent the Lord Jesus Christ. He sent Him into this world to go to a cross. To go to a cross to bear the sins, to bear our sins on His body upon that tree. We read the verse before. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world to save us from our sins, to take our sins and save it, to give us eternal life. See, the Lord Jesus Christ was unique. In Him there was no sin. He knew no sin. He could not sin. He did no sin. There was no guile found in His mouth. Yet He became sin for us. He went to that cross and bore all our sins upon His body on that tree. But He didn't just die. He arose on that third day. He was not only able to save, he was willing to save, that he saved us the uttermost. He rose from that grave, and now he lives forevermore. And friends, if you ask who I am, I can say I'm a Christian. I'm one who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a beneficiary of what he's done. I've accepted the free gift of salvation, which is available to all of us today. That on the 17th of March, 2009, in a place called Six Oxford Court, Nary Warren South, down the freeway. I got on my knees and I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I asked Him to come into my life. That I was called out of darkness into His marvelous light. That's what the Bible says. And in Bible terms, I was born again. I was given a new life. I was given a new identity. A life worth living. A fulfilled life. And you may be sitting here and say, I'm already a Christian. Well, I've been christened. Well, I've done this many years ago. Someone's prayed over me and I've accepted the Lord. My parents go to church. I go to a Christian school. I do good deeds. The Bible says that salvation is not of works. It is through the gift of God, which gives us everlasting life. 
You see, when the Lord Jesus Christ was on this earth, he said these words, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. We have to go through the Lord. That we have to do what this man did here in verse 6. We read in verse 6. When he saw the Lord, he ran and worshipped him. He ran and worshipped him. Uh, and cried out with a loud voice, What have I to do with thee, that son of the most high God? That we must go to the Lord ourselves, just like this man, and confess our sins to him, because he is faithful and just to forgive us from our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So who are you really? What is your name? Who are you? What is your identity? We also read further on in verse 15. When we've described this man... And for what he's done and his current state, living by himself away in the tombs, having no life, a self-destructive, a frenzied, untamable man. We read in verse 15 that he was clothed in his right mind. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ can save you today. He can take a drunkard and make him clothed in his right mind. One who is a compulsive gambler, an addict, and make him clothed in his right mind. He can take one who was possessed with demons and having everything wrong in his life and clothe him in his right mind. That's what he can do. Christ can save you if you believe on him. There's no mountain too high for the Lord. There's no sin too big to forgive. There's no, maybe you don't have a purpose in your life. Maybe you think you're living an unfulfilled life. That all you do is wake up, you eat. You work, you sleep, repeat. That's what you do every day. There's no, there's no purpose in your life. You see, Christ can give you a purpose. He can give you a purpose that this world can't give. A peace that this world can't give. He can make you have your sins forgiven and give you a home in heaven. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that we're proclaiming here today. So verse 15, that this man who was once a demonic man, a man with an unclean spirit, is clothed in his right mind. And people were afraid. The people there probably thought that, oh, you know, this person could never be saved. There's absolutely no chance that this person's ever getting saved. We don't want anything to do with him anyway. But when they saw what the Lord did, they were afraid. They, they, were, they were scared. They were worried. They, they just couldn't believe it. Because someone that was living such a crazy life before became new, became clothed in his right mind. And that's what the Lord can do for you today if you put your faith and trust in him. We go on reading in verse 20. And he, and he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus has done for him and all men did marvel. See, friends, today, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter the life you used to live or what you're doing. Christ can save you. We read on Wednesday night of a man called Apostle Paul, one who was consenting to the death of Stephen, the first mentioned when he was called Saul, consenting to his death, agreeing with his death, where he was breathing out threatenings, and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord. And God converted him. And he can go on to pen almost half the New Testament. And he could say these words. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. The one who was described as the chief of sinners. The one who that time where people, went, when they saw Paul... They probably thought to, to, to themselves, there's no way that this man could be saved. He absolutely despised Christians. He didn't want anything to do with them. But Christ changed him just like that. And he can do that for you today. But in verse 20, we read here that when the Lord Jesus Christ healed this man, he went on and published in De De uh, Decapolis how great things Jesus has done for him. And all men did marvel. You see, Christians want to tell of Christ. They want to tell others of what he has done for them in their lives. How he take, took it all. He bore all our sins on his body upon that tree and died for us. A death that we may go free. That we were once sinners heading to a place called hell. A place of eternal condemnation. A place destined for the devil and his angels. But Christ saves us. He gives us a new life. A once unclean, a once un uncontrollable, unstable unsettled man can give a new life and clothe him in his right mind. We have all been changed if we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I'd like to share a story with you of I was watching football highlights and there was a before the match the players would walk out to the stadium stadium packed with play, uh, 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 fans and sometimes they hold up these banners and they make a big mosaic of a word and it was a Manchester United game and they're playing a, a team in Turkey called Galatasaray and you know what that banners um, represented or the words they represented when the Manchester United players walked out. The word said, welcome to hell. You see, you see, friends, if you die in your sins, you'll be going to hell. You'll be going to a place destined and a place which is created for the devil and his angels. A place in which the Bible says of unquenchable fire. Hell is a very real place, but so is heaven. And the Bible talks about heaven being a place which nothing can enter into it, which defiles it. Nothing which is unclean. We need our sins forgiven. And this is done through and exclusively through the Lord Jesus Christ. Not through works. Not through anything less man should boast, but through the finished work of Calvary. So let me ask you again. What is your name? Who are you? Have you trusted on the finished work of Christ? That he can make anyone, one who is demonic, and clothe him in his right mind. He can save you today if you place your faith and trust in Him. Let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this message of the Gospel in which You have showed us that You indeed can save and You can save anyone that puts your faith and trust in You. Heavenly Father, we just do pray for uh, that if there's anyone here that hasn't accepted You as their Lord and personal Saviour, that they'll come and make this decision without any delay. That they'll come before You and confess their sins for you are faithful and just to forgive them from their sins and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Heavenly Father, we just do pray that you help us in all things. Even pray for the Bible class, which is coming up now for Uncle Bobby, that he will speak well. Um, and we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.